in thinking about robust or intuitive versus statistically efficient choices, uh, the other place this comes up is what weighting matrix would you like to use if you're going after a minimization approach as opposed to what A matrix do you want to use if you're just going to set some moments equal to zero. Again, you can use a W matrix that you think is robust or interesting, or you can follow the statistical advice and use the spectral density matrix. So what goes wrong, what can go wrong, when you go for the efficient one and use the S matrix? Uh, well, let's take any S matrix. You can always uh, decompose it into, uh, by eigenvalues into a, a Q matrix, a diagonal matrix, and a matrix of eigenvectors. That's a very convenient way to understand what the S matrix is doing. If we do that, then the, the minimization becomes Q prime GT, lambda inverse Q prime GT, where this is now a diagonal of variance covariance matrix. So you can see what the S matrix does. It's doing two things. It's forming some portfolios. A linear combination of GT says evaluate it on some different portfolios, and then pay attention to those new portfolios in inverse proportion uh, to the variance of the GTs corresponding to those portfolios. So let's look at two examples. One, one example, the simple one we looked at a little bit, suppose the S matrix just has diagonals in it, then this Q is just a 1, so our minimization is minimize moment 1 squared over S1, moment 2 squared over S2. And again, GMM, what it's doing is if S2 is very small, it pays a lot of attention to the well-measured moment, which is the same thing as the moment with very low variance, because things with low variance are well measured. That seems fairly sensible. Where we get in trouble is if, as always the case for us, there's a lot of correlation between the assets. So suppose the S matrix had, I just made a simple correlation matrix, with rho being the correlation. Then this is its eigenvalue decomposition, a Q matrix, and a 1 plus rho and 1 minus rho on the diagonals. Now what our minimization will do is, is it tells us, look at two portfolios. One portfolio is the sum of the two returns, and the other portfolio is the difference of the two returns. That's the 1 minus 1 and the 1 plus 1. Then wait. Let's look at the, this one divided by 1 plus rho, and that one divided by 1 minus rho. Now as rho, the correlation increases, you can see what's going to happen. The GMM is going to pay almost all its attention on that moment there, because 1 minus rho becomes a smaller and smaller number. And it's paying attention on the difference between two assets, much as OLS, GLS here was paying attention to first differences because we had correlation over time. Now, maybe you want to pay for attention to differences between two assets, and maybe you don't. Most of the time, since our Ms don't move as much as the Rs, we're basically trying to find sample minimum variance returns, because returns with small variance are very well measured. But minimum variance returns in sample are notoriously poorly measured. Think of a mean variance frontier. The minimum variance return is that one over there. And any time you do this with any kind of, uh, any kind of large sample, what do you get? The, the, the minimum variance portfolio is formed by incredibly strong long-short positions. Well, your data may accommodate incredibly long, strong long-short positions. They may be well measured. Your agents in your model may be able to take positions leveraged to factors of 1,000. Or maybe not. Maybe it's not wise to use highly leveraged long-short positions as the basis for your estimation and testing. What often happens in practice, you might find two securities, like an on-the-run and an off-the-run treasury, very highly correlated, and then the minimum variance portfolio takes an incredibly strong long-short position. Do you really want to base everything you have on that? Now, efficient GMM didn't know that there were small pricing errors. Efficient GMM didn't know that agents in your model couldn't lever up by a factor of 1,000. Well, you can either put that all in the model, or you can force the model not to do things like that, force the model to look at the levels of things rather than big differences. I think one of the bottom lines here is look. Try to understand what GMM is doing. This de eigenvalue decomposition is a very nice way of looking at what portfolios is GMM paying attention to? Which portfolios is it perfectly pricing? How much weight is it putting on those portfolios? At least you get a sense, if you're going to do efficiency, of what it's doing and whether you trust uh, what it's doing when it's doing it. That's GMM. Mm -hmm.